geological force and 10 million, 20 million, 100 million years from now, if they're sitting in human beings, they will identify this layer where there's plastic all over everything as the layer that, you know, like instead of checking for, um, uh, you know, clay minerals and volcanic ash, they'll look for plastic, you know, and they'll understand where it was going. And this is the age this is just, this all just happened in the last couple of months. You know, floods and hurricanes, this happened five miles from my house. The forests in western Montana are burning up. You know, 220 million years ago when the continents were all different places, <coughs> sturgeon evolved. And they've lived through all kinds of different eras and different ecosystems and different climate zones. They've lived through the destruction of the dinosaurs. And they're becoming extinct today. Yeah, let's understand what's going on here. This is, this is Homo erectus. Homo erectus was around for two million years more than two million, three million years, they did pretty well. They moved all around the planet, you see. They, they adapted to different, different um, climates. But they never dominated the Earth. They always were within the ecological balances. And then Homo sapiens came along, and they were also, in the beginning, Homo sapiens weren't particularly successful. They almost went extinct a couple of times. It wasn't such a good, a good combination of events, you know, sturgeons did a lot better. And then about 70,000 years ago, something happened. Human beings evolved art. Now what's important about art? Well, let's look at the human art, early human art first. This is now around 40,000 years ago. This is a sculpture, a beautiful sculpture. But it doesn't represent reality. It's not a representation of reality. It's a, a human figure, a man, with a lion's head. Look at this from a cave painting in France, okay? This is, um, again, a human figure with a bird's head, a giant erection. There's a bird over here. There's a bison here, a spear. Guts are coming out of the bison. This is a mythology. This is a story. Human beings, look, chimpanzees, lots of, lots of species use tools. Chimpanzees and ravens, lots of species use tools. Many, many species communicate. But human beings evolved the ability and the desire to think about things that don't exist. None of this exists. They created mythologies. They sat around and created mythologies. They thought about abstract things. A woman last night said, well, my dog thinks about abstract things. Well, you know, I know your dog knows that you come home at five o'clock every day and stuff, but it doesn't invent mythologies. No chimpanzees has grabbed a stick and drawn a picture of a uh, elephant with a zebra head in the sand, you know. It's never happened. We've watched chimpanzees for a long time. Humans evolved a different kind of thinking conceptually, and this led to science to thinking about, in the abstract, about things they couldn't directly see or touch. Look what we got out of this, man. This is really cool. I flew here in an airplane, you know, I'd be dead if we didn't have modern surgery. I don't have a house like that, but I certainly have an iPhone. Actually, I don't, but I'm going to get one soon because my brother's trading in his and he's going to sell me for 50 bucks. So I'm on my way. Look. So what do we do with our mythology? We have three main mythologies in Western civilization. Religion, which is really cool. Lots of people get solace from religion. But then we distort our mythologies to create warfare. 
Same thing with government. Government is really good. They deliver the mail and build roads and stuff. But, you know, Napoleon talked in the name of France. He talked a million men to go to Russia and attack the Russians, and 20,000 came back waving the flag. It's a mythology, you see. And, uh, yeah, money. Yeah, money is another great mythology. Look. See this? I reach into my wallet, you know, and I pull out this green thing, and I stick it in a little hole, and they give me gasoline. This doesn't represent anything. Only about 5% of the actual value of currencies exists. The other 90% is a mythology. We all believe in it, you know. And that's kind of handy, you know, it's easier than carrying around a bunch of dozen eggs and stuff, but mythology allows some people to manipulate the money so they live here, and the people that can't manipulate the money are picking out of the garbage dump. It creates a um, separation of wealth that never existed in hunter-gatherer tribes. Einstein said that the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So the development of mythologies, abstract thought, created our science, but it also created our problems. And Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb, a population biologist now at Stanford, he wrote, no, he didn't write, we had coffee, he told me this. <laughs> he said, humanity is in dire need of a spiritual revolution to move into the 21st century with a reasonable hope of creating a peaceful, healthy, and equitable world. Spiritual revolution. Yeah. I'm a backcountry skier. This is a, a route uh, up into the mountains. You can see the mountains kind of up in here, up in Brit British Columbia. I've walked this trail a million times. How many times do I walk this trail and think about other things? It's so beautiful, but this is what's going on all too frequently in my mind, you know? We all live in the stories we invent in our heads. And it's so much more wondrous when we get out. I say, manage my mythologies. That's what mindfulness is all about. One way to do it, look, there's many ways to do it. Yeah, one way to do it is with nature, by communicating with animals, by talking to the wolf. Here I am down in the Beagle Channel, also on a solo trip to kayak around Cape Horn and I'm paddling along and a sudden storm comes up and the tide is running against the wind and all of a sudden I'm out there alone in the Beagle Channel surfing these giant waves in deep water you know and I'm scared and all of a sudden there's a noise you know and there's a dolphin surfing the wave right next to me right and then whoop, whoop, there's two dolphins surfing the wave on the other side of me. It's so simple. You know, and nature will come and talk to you. If you open yourself up. And once you reach that level, the dolphin is just simply, I don't know whether those dolphins knew I was scared and were coming to help me or were just being playful, but it doesn't matter. It takes you out of your humanness and puts you back into your aboriginal humanness and or your animal instincts and so on. When I started going around the country and making these talks, you know, I get these people to raise their hand. They say, well, I don't want to go around Cape Horn. I don't want to go up in Ellesmere Island where it's cold. So what does your talk have to do with me? Well, I put this talk to dance with a group out of Boston. And we danced. 
basically the same talk I'm giving you here. Even I got to dance, you know. <laughs> and we danced in Boston and New York and San Francisco and all kinds of places. One day we were in Colorado and we had a grant from the Colorado uh, Department of Fine Arts or something. Our job was to dance for adult audiences in the evenings and talk to school groups during the day. And we go to Park Avenue School and Main Street School and St. Joseph's School and whatnot and talk to the kids. And then they gave us our assignment to go to the Youth Recovery Center. What? And we went to the Youth Recovery Center where it was a brick building and there were bars on the windows and steel doors and guys with guns, you see. It was a prison. And there were 14 to 18 year olds in the prison. And they had messed up, you know. They were in jail. And they walked in, you know, they shuffled in the room with this defeated attitude of the child criminals that they were or weren't. One young woman, 14 or 15 years old, was chewing on her water bottle like it was a baby bottle. And they told us to, you know, work with these kids for an hour and turn their lives around, right? <laughs> We hadn't practiced for this. We didn't know what was going on, right? And Jody, the choreographer, says, John, you're the talker. You talk. Start. And I had no idea what I was going to say. And I said, you know, we all get broken. We break our bones. We break our spirits. Society gets broken. We break our politics. We break our country. We break our environment. We have to learn how to heal. And nature will teach us how to heal, but since you're in prison, there's other ways. And dance will teach you how to heal. You're not going to get out of this prison by being tough. You're going to get you're going to dance your way out of prison. And we all started dancing. And at the end of the hour, every one of those child criminals was dancing their way out of prison. In my book, Crocodiles and Ice, I, I do a long section on uh, Tibet, which I didn't have time to enclose here, and ended up at the birthplace of the Dalai Lama. And I ended the book with this paragraph. And I think it's safe to paraphrase what the Dalai Lama is so patiently and assiduously telling us. That if we free our minds of all the extraneous input and confusion, the random useless mythologies we invent for no good reason, we might be lucky enough so that that empty space will fill with ecstasy. And then ecstasy will morph seamlessly into compassion for ourselves, our neighbors, and our planet. That one word, compassion, stands out loud and strong in all of the Dalai Lama's writings and teachings as the consciousness revolution that will be the beginning of healing Is it really that simple? Or should I say, why do we make up stories to make it that complex and difficult? Thank you.